Hello and welcome to Byju's IAS presenting to you the daily quiz for 12th of August 2021. Let us begin and have a look at the first question for today. Which of the given statements with respect to quality of life for elderly index is or are correct? The index was created by Niti Aayog to shed light on the problems faced by the elderly citizens in India. Its framework includes four pillars of financial well-being, social well-being, health system and income security. What is the context? This is an article in the PIB and it says that the quality of life for elderly index has been released by Dr. Bibek Debroy, who is the chairman of the Economic Advisory Council to the Prime Minister. This index throws light upon the issue that is not often discussed, that is, the problems faced by the elderly in India. It gives deeper insight into how well India is doing to support the well-being of its aging population. And also, it helps in understanding the needs as well as the opportunities for the elderly population in the country and also help the policy makers to introduce relevant policies and schemes for their well-being. This index categorizes the states as aged, that is with an elderly population of more than 5 million and relatively aged, that is with the elderly population of less than 5 million. Let us understand more on this index while we discuss the answer. Coming to statement number 1, this index does shed light on problems faced by the elderly citizens in India, correct? But the index was not created by Niti Aayog, but was created by the Institute for Competitiveness on the request of the Economic Advisory Council to the Prime Minister. So statement number 1 becomes incorrect. The index framework includes four pillars, which is the financial well-being, social well-being, health system and income security, as well as eight sub-pillars, which are economic empowerment, educational attainment and employment, social status, physical security, basic health, psychological well-being, social security and enabling environment. So there are four pillars and eight sub-pillars to this index. Making statement number two correct. Therefore, the right answer to this question would be option B, two only. So now what are the findings of this report by the Institute for Competitiveness? The health system pillar observes the highest national average that is 66.97 score at an All India level. And this is followed by social well-being. Next comes financial well-being but the states have performed particularly worse in the income security pillar because over half of the states have a score below the national average of 33.03 in income security. In the index, Rajasthan and Himachal Pradesh are the top scoring regions in the 8 states and the relatively 8 states categories respectively. Moving on to question number 2. Which among the following is or are Earth observation satellites? Megatropics, Saral, OceanSat, IRNSS1A, Bhaskara 1. Why this question? This article in the Indian Express newspaper today talks about the Earth observation satellite EOS-3 that was scheduled to be placed into geostationary orbit today. The question is asking us for Earth observation satellites. Megatropics is an Earth observation satellite. It is a satellite mission that was launched in the year 2011 to study the water cycle in tropical atmosphere in the context of climate change. So this is correct. Saral is a joint Indo-French satellite that was launched for oceanographic studies. Yes, so this is also an Earth observation satellite. So number 2 is also correct. Number 3, OceanSat is a series of Earth observation satellite again which was launched by ISRO dedicated to oceanography and atmospheric studies. So number 3 also becomes correct. The IRNSS-1A is the first satellite in the Indian Regional Navigation Satellite System. It is not an Earth observation satellite but is a navigational satellite. So this was a part of the satellite navigation system launched for providing accurate real-time positioning services. So this is not an Earth observation satellite. Coming to Bhaskara 1. This was India's first low-orbit Earth observation satellite and it collected data on telemetry, oceanography and hydrology. So this is also an Earth observation satellite. So the right answer to our question would be option C, 1, 2, 3 and 5 only. So these Earth observation satellites help us to monitor and protect the environment. They help manage the resources, respond to global humanitarian disasters and also enable sustainable development. 
they provide essential information on a vast number of areas such as ocean salinity ice thickness crop health air quality etc isro used to earlier name its earth observation satellites according to the purpose they were meant to serve but the new generation earth observation satellites are a part of the eos series and eos1 was launched in november 2020 EOS 3 that was supposed to be launched today is a part of the new generation of earth observation satellites that was meant to provide almost real time images of large parts of India Unfortunately 5 minutes after the lift off the GSLV rocket that was carrying EOS 3 satellite malfunctioned and led to the failure of this mission Now let us take up question number 3 which of the given statements is or are correct The demographic dividend is the economic growth potential resulting out of changing population age structure in a country when the dependency ratio is minimum and the age pyramid shows bulge in the middle portion the country is said to be in demographic dividend phase in india the year 2018 is known as the year of demographic divide Why this question? This article in the Hindu newspaper today says that PwC India, which is a global consultancy firm, is creating 10,000 additional jobs and its chairman opines that this will help India take advantage of its demographic dividend. So what exactly is demographic dividend? As per the definition of United Nations Population Fund, demographic dividend is the economic growth potential that can result from shifts in a population's age structure. And this occurs mainly when the working age population, which is between 15 to 64 years, is more as compared to the non-working age share of the population, which is people under 14 years of age and people over 65 years of age. In simple terms, when the people in the workforce is growing relative to the dependent population, the economic growth potential in the country is known as demographic dividend. So statement number 1 here becomes correct. Now coming to statement number 2, looking at this age structure pyramid, when there is a bulge in the middle, that is when the population in the age group of 15 to 64 is more as compared to those below 15 years and those above 64 years of age, the country is said to be in a demographic dividend phase. So this bulge represents the demographic dividend phase. Therefore statement number 2 is correct as when the dependency ratio is minimum and the age pyramid shows bulge in the middle portion the country is said to be in a demographic dividend phase since the year 2018 india's working age population has grown larger than the dependent population and this bulge in the working age population is expected to last until 2055 or 37 years from its beginning But statement number 3 can be confusing because while since 2018 the working age population has started growing this year is not called as the year of demographic divide the year of demographic divide or the year of great divide is the year 1921 because this is regarded as a defining year as before this year the population was not constant sometimes it increased and at the other times it decreased the growth scale of population was usually low below 1921 but after this year there has been a considerable and constant increase in the population therefore 1921 and not 2018 is known as the year of demographic divide therefore the right answer to our question would be option a 1 and 2 only moving on to question number 4 Which of the given pairs is or are correctly matched? Centers of revolt of 1857, British generals who suppressed the revolt. Number 1 Jhansi, Sir Colin Campbell. Number 2 Lucknow, Sir Hugh Rose. Number 3 Delhi, John Nicholson. Why this question? This article in the Hindu newspaper today has a mention of the queens Rani Lakshmi Bai, Kittur Rani Chennamma and also Begum Hazrat Mahal and hence this question. In Jhansi the great mutiny of 1857 was led by Jhansi ki rani Lakshmi Bai and here in Jhansi the revolt was quelled by Sir Hugh Rose and not Colin Campbell therefore this becomes incorrect In Lucknow Begum Hazrat Mahal the mother of Birjis Kadar took up the leadership as Nawab of Oudh Wajid Ali Shah was exiled to Calcutta and this revolt was suppressed by Sir Colin Campbell who attacked Lucknow with a Gorkha regiment so number 2 is also incorrect Coming to the center of revolt that was Delhi Bahadur Shah Zafar was the Mughal emperor during the revolt of 1857 
his main objective was to revive the lost glory of the Mughal Empire and on his behalf, Mughal forces were led by a military general named Bhakt Khan. John Nicholson defeated the Mughal forces in Delhi and later on Lieutenant Hudson was also responsible for suppressing the revolt in Delhi. So the right answer to this question would be option B, 3 only. Now let us take up a previous year question from prelims paper 2015. Doctors Without Borders, Medicine Sans Frontiers, often in the news, is a division of the World Health Organization, a non-governmental international organization, an intergovernmental agency sponsored by European Union, a specialized agency of the United Nations. Doctors Without Borders is a non-governmental and non-military organization that was established by a group of French doctors in the year 1971. It is best known for the projects in the conflict zones and in the countries affected by endemic diseases. Therefore, the right answer to this question would be option B. Doctors Without Borders is a non-governmental international organization. Now let us take up the fact of the day which is right to education. The National Commission for Protection of Child Rights, which is NCPCR, after having assessed minority schools in the country, has suggested that the minority schools must be bought under the Right to Education Act. And the report that NCPCR has submitted in this regard is titled Impact of Exemption under Article 15 Clause 5 with regards to Article 21A of the Constitution of India on education of children in minority communities. At present, the minority schools, that is, the schools run by the minority organizations, are exempt from implementing the right to education policy and they also do not fall under the government's Sarva Shiksha Abhiyan. First, let us understand what is Right to Education Act. The act is completely titled the Right of Children to Free and Compulsory Education Act. This act was passed by the parliament in the year 2009. The Right to Education Act aims to provide primary education to all the children aged between 6 to 14 years. So it lays down the modalities of importance of free and compulsory education for children between the age of 6 to 14 years in India under Article 21A of the Indian Constitution. So this act enforces the education as a fundamental right. The RTA mandates 25% reservation for disadvantaged sections of the society in schools. It also makes provision for non-admitted children to be admitted to an age-appropriate class. The Act also talks about sharing of financial and other responsibilities between the central and the state governments. And to ensure free and compulsory quality education to children, this Act, that is the Right to Education Act, provides for norms with respect to basic minimum infrastructure that has to be there, the number of teachers in a school, books, uniforms, as well as midday meals, etc. So, with this act, India has moved to a rights-based approach towards implementing education for all. And this act casts a legal obligation on the state and the central government to execute the fundamental right of a child as per Article 21A of the Constitution. So, how are minority schools exempt from RTE Act and Sarva Siksha Abhiyan? The year was 2002 and the 86th Amendment to the Constitution was passed. This amendment provided the right to education as a fundamental right. And the very same amendment inserted Article 21A into the Constitution. This article, that is Article 21A, made right to education a fundamental right for children aged between 6 and 14 years. Right? The passage of the amendment was followed by the launch of Sarva Shiksha Abhiyan. And four years later, that is in the year 2006, the 93rd Constitutional Amendment Act inserted Clause 5 in Article 15. And this Clause 5 in Article 15 enabled the state to create a special provision such as reservation for advancement of any backward classes of citizens like the SEs and the STs in all aided and unaided educational institutions but except for minority education institutions. Subsequently, in the year 2009, the Right to Education Act was passed and this act made it mandatory to include underprivileged children in the schools. Specifically, Section 12, Clause 1, Clause C of the RTE Act provided for 25% reservation of seats in unaided schools for admission of children from economically weaker section and disadvantaged groups. But, 
in contrast to all these amendments and acts the article 30 of indian constitution talks about the right of minorities to establish and administer educational institutions so in the year 2012 through an amendment the institutions imparting religious education were exempted from following the rte act so when the validity of exemption under article 15 clause 5 was in question the supreme court declared that the right to education act is inapplicable to schools with a minority status because the act should not interfere with the rights of minorities so now the issue that ncpcr has highlighted is that it has found a surge in the number of schools that are applying for this minority status certification after the 93rd amendment was brought in so now article 21a that guarantees fundamental rights of education to all the children and article 30 which allows the minorities to set up their own institutions with their own rules and article 15 clause 5 which exempts the minority schools from right to education act has created a conflict between the fundamental right of children and the right of minority communities and the ncpcr study has found that there are certain detrimental effects of this particular exemption so through its report ncpcr has made many recommendations to make strict guidelines for minority schools and one of the highlights of the recommendations made by ncpcr is that these schools that is the minority schools must be bought under the right to education act as well as the sarva shiksha abhiyan which has now been subsumed under the samagra shiksha abhiyan That is all for today. Thank you for being with us. Keep watching and keep learning.